Uh, members, we, uh, we now move on to questions to the Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure. Question number 12 has been withdrawn, and I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Ms. Sugden. Uh, question number one, please. Gormagat, I can't kill her. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the member for her question. I can advise members that the funding allocation to disability sport NI, has no direct impact on the activities of Special Olympics Ireland, which is a completely separate organisation. I can confirm that DECAL provided £459,000 of core funding to Special Olympics Ireland along with colleagues from FMD, FM Health, DSD and Education towards a £2.3 million cross-departmental package covering the four-year period from 2011 to 2015. This package was extended by a further £545,000 for the period of 2015-2016. Um, and the funding package has enabled the organisation to expand its activities throughout the north and extend its reach in providing sports training and competition opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities. It included support for the athletes from here who represent, represented Ireland in this year's Special Olympics World Games in Los Angeles. The Special Olympics team had one of the most successful games ever with athletes from the North making a significant contribution to the medals won at the Games, and I'm delighted to report that the team did exceptionally well, securing 82 medals. I'm also proud of the achievements of the 12 athletes uh, from the North who secured 19 medals, including five golds, nine silver and five bronze. I'll call Ms Sugden for a supplementary. I uh, thank the Minister for her response, and I, I welcome that um, there will be no direct impact on uh, uh, Special Olympics. Um, coming from uh, a successful Olympic town as Corium, where in the recent uh, Special Olympics, uh, Sean Campbell won silver. Um, I do think it's important that the Minister uh, acknowledges that the part that uh, uh, disabled uh, bodied people have in, in, in sport. And may I ask, does she, does she have any plans to introduce further money, money to this sector? Well, thank the member for her, her supplementary question. And indeed, Coleraine has a great heritage in terms of Olympians and Paralympians and Special Olympians and indeed other uh, and greater uh, numbers of participation in sport generally across the board. There's clear increases there. The answer is yes. At the moment we're cu currently working with colleagues in Sport NI. I recently met uh, with Special Olympics Ireland as well uh, and have and will have meetings with Disability Sports NI to ensure that when we're particularly when we're looking at the next CSR that the business cases are not only refreshed, but try to reflect the increase in numbers of participation for athletes. And I think it's really important that we do that, given the fact that looking at the successes that they had in competitions, clearly, not only is it about participation, but certainly the achievement of the athletes has been enjoyed by us all. I call Ms. Karen McKevitt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister to outline how her department and Sport NI uh, will support athletes preparing for the Olympics, the 2016 Olympics and the Paralympics, given that you know, a bit of investment has been done, and you can see that uh, with the medals that has been won. What further can her department uh, advice and monetary uh, give uh, to the, those preparing for the Olympics? Well, thank the member for a question, and certainly she will remember the, the build-up to the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, and certainly you know, the work of the, particularly the families and the governing bodies, actually ensured that the athletes were able to go over to London and perform. It's that sort of spirit that we're hoping to capture for the 2016 Games, but it won't happen on its own without support, particularly through Sport and I to the governing bodies. I know Sport and I are actively meeting all the governing bodies as we speak certainly in terms of the, the athletes' performance programme and other supports that we can give them in preparation for the 2016 Games. Sandra, over then. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for her responses. It is recognised uh, that the Minister's budget is limited, but is she prepared to reconsider her existing allocations to the disability sports legacy? Well, certainly the disability sports is one of the protections that we need to look at, particularly within the ALBs. Um, as I said in response to Ms McEvitt, we're currently working with Sport NI and with Disability NI and indeed some of the other governing bodies who do provide opportunities for people with disabilities. Uh, we certainly need to try and ensure that if we do receive additional monies that we target those who are in most need. 
Thank you. And I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Akesh Devrado, question number two, please. Uh, I thank the member for her question. I am currently developing an arts and cultural strategy to ensure recognition is given to the value that arts and culture has in enriching the lives of individuals and building capacity of our communities and growing our economy and, creative, uh, and create a more inclusive society. I firmly believe that the arts and culture deserve a central place given their importance in contributing to positive health and well-being and developing skills uh, and confidence on individual levels as well as within communities. Arts and culture are also inspirational drivers for creative industries and make a significant contribution to creating a cohesive society and certainly helping put the promotion of tourism. In conjunction with the Ministerial Arts Advisory Forum, I had established DECAL as finalising a consultation document which I propose to launch before Christmas. Through this consultation, we will listen to the views of the public and intend to bring forward an arts and cultural strategy with, with, which will have a focus on delivering to the public and promoting equality. I totally believe in the value of arts and culture and all that it can bring to everyone. I think it is vital that the best opportunities to enjoy arts and culture are made available to everyone, and I hope that an aspiration can be shared and achieved by delivering a successful engaging consultation that will inform future policy direction. Thank you. And I call Ms. Ryan for a supplementary. Um, I was and Fragershin, um, and I wonder could you outline some details regarding when the consultation will begin and how long it will last? Well, certainly, as I indicated my primary answer, uh, I would anticipate that the consultation certainly brought forward before Christmas. I'm actually hoping around November. I would like the consultation to be no less than 12 weeks, but I'm actually looking at the possibility of it being 20 weeks. This is the first time there's ever been an overarching uh, cross-departmental strategy for arts and culture ever. We have one for sports. It's the right thing to do. It's going to be for at least 10 years. And I'd like as many people as possible to engage in this consultation, because it isn't just about people participating. It's also a good economic driver, and I think that's what's missing, particularly in when people talk about the arts, it's also about arts in terms of creating job opportunities, creating apprenticeships, and also creating, particularly when we look at our film and television industry, uh, certainly trends in the economy that I, I believe aren't getting the attention that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I certainly welcome the Minister's initiative for consultation, but given the haphazard way that the arts funding has been cut. I mean, there's overall this year of 20 nearly 20% cut to the arts se uh, sector. Uh, arts Council, can I ask the Minister, how can she provide us any reassurance that the arts sector is not going to be decimated? Well, certainly the concern that the, members, the member has highlighted actually is the, one of the main reasons we need to ensure that there's a cross-departmental strategy for arts and culture. Uh, it is completely unsatisfactory the situation that we're all in, in terms of not having budget secured. It is crucial that we get cross-departmental, cross-executive buy-in to a robust strategy for arts and culture. It needs to be properly costed and it needs to be properly consulted. And it isn't, while I did have a focus in terms of the economy, I know the member has raised certainly concerns around intercultural arts strategies, which do, do impact on various departments. But for me, it's about embedding the arts within the spend of government from here on. And this is about future proofing. And I completely agree with the member. We need to have a better security, particularly around arts. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael Majimsey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. And with the Speaker's permission, I will take questions three and six together, and I thank the member for his question. My department has been developing the sub-regional programme for soccer. A strategic outline business case has been developed with DFP, uh, and approval was received in June of this year. The programme specifically details in terms of criteria, funding strands, funding limits are currently being finalised. 
Plans for formal public consultation with sta stakeholders are underway, and I hope to commence a consultation very shortly. Following this public con consultation, it is envisaged that the sub-regional programme will be formally launched in 2016. A step through of the assessment process, including the various audits of need, competitions and business cases, is planned for 2016, with capital delivery to be undertaken in the financial years of 2016 to 2018. The forthcoming process for allocation of funding will be a fair, open and transparent process and will be based on evidenced approach and demonstrated need and investment. Award recommendations will be made based on criteria and projects attaining a high assessment score, and I will approve all uh, award decisions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Could she indicate to us today, uh, while she's still in the planning process, what notional budget she plans to allocate uh, to this programme? Can she confirm the number of grounds she anticipates benefiting uh, from uh, the programme? And when does she actually anticipate monies reaching uh, the various clubs and organisations to be spent on the ground? Thank you. I'm that it's the remainder of the uh, regional stadium money, which is £36 million. Um, in terms of number of clubs, I can't say at this stage because it all depends uh, on their their eligibility and indeed on the criteria. Uh, we would hope at this phase, I mean I have already made my intentions known, I would like a phase two of sub-regional develop development for the three sports. I think there's a big need for it. But certainly in this, in this uh, first phase of sub-regional, it, it would be anticipated that as many clubs as possible who are in a state of readiness to bring their plans forward. I am aware that many have been doing this for at least a year. Uh, and, and I welcome that, but certainly I am delighted that I received DFP approval in June of this year. We are in the final stages of preparing the consultation to go out to public consultation, and I would anticipate certainly at the beginning of 2016 of this financial year, but going right through to 2018 and the next mandate, that this programme will be delivered. And I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the. The Minister for a comprehensive answer. The Minister will be aware that some football clubs are better organised than others, have greater resources. What additional help is available to those clubs that perhaps are not as au fait with making applications for funding? And can she assure us that the money will in fact be dispersed across the region? Well, I appreciate the member's question, and it's, it's a concern that I've had for some time, not just within sport, but certainly within arts, that some of the big, well-organised organisations, it's like those who shout the loudest get, and that's not where I want to be. In fact, that's not where most members want to be. Um, so to that end, I've asked my officials to take responsibility for this programme. As part of consultation along with the IFA, they will be out and about on others. Uh, we have had engagements with some of the new councils, uh, but it's important the clubs can come forward in their own right, and they will be supported in doing so. My officials already know that some areas are better organised than others, and some clubs are better organised than others. So, in the first instance, everybody will be given the same information, but certainly there will be an assessment uh, of you know, how we anticipate clubs will, will be able to proceed. And if we get a sense that a club might have all the needs and tick all the boxes, but if it can't progress for them because of its own capacity, they will need to try and identify some support. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answers to date? And uh, can I ask her to further outline what form will the consultation into sub-regional facilities uh, take? Well, First of all, I think it's important um, that we don't just stick to the usual. Just look at the website, and maybe you might see it in a, a box somewhere in a local paper, some night or whatever. I think it's important that I, as Minister, and lead for this, go out and explain to people as much as possible in my department. We will be doing it with the IFA, we will be doing it with others, but I want to ensure that as many pe people as possible have an opportunity to feed into this consultation. Because in response to Mr. Dallet's question, um, certainly Ms. Mr. McGimsey's question. While this is the first phase of the sub-regional, I do anticipate perhaps phases two and three for the other two uh, partners in the regional stadium programme. 
and it's important that we get a good profile of where the need is. Thank you. And I call Mr. Cahill O'Hashin. I thank the member for his question. I am committed to seeking to secure £2.5 million for the development of a community sports facility in Dungiven as part of the legacy of the City of Culture for the North West. This commitment, like all major capital investment, is subject to budget availability and the approval of a business case which will include confirmation of any necessary partnership funding for the project. I understand that the Causeway Coast and Glens Borough Council has completed a consultation exercise on plans for the sporting provision in Dungiven and is progressing with the development of a business case and detailed designs. Officials from DECAL and Sport and I are working very closely with the Council to provide support and advice with regard to the business case. Uh, in addition, in the, in the as well as this, under the Boxing Investment Programme, Sport and I has issued an indicative letter of offer to St Canice's Amateur Boxing Club in Dungiven. Um, and they, that club also received boxing equipment with a total value um, of £1,600. In the last financial year, DECAL has also provided £12,000 for a range of digital equipment. Uh, for the cultural hub at the Embrata Community Association through the North West Social and Economic Development Plan. And I know the Minister knows well my personal interest in this, uh, not only this one, but also in the North Coast Sports Village, which of course was the partner project. But could the Minister give me some sort of idea of a completion date for particularly the community uh, sports project in Dungiven? Well, certainly, I, I've, I mean, anticipation of your, your question, I checked again with officials and, I mean, things are very well progressed. I've made a very public commitment at every opportunity about the investment going into the Dungiven area. But certainly there, there, there are governance issues that we need to cover, not due diligence. We do need to complete the business case. We do need to ensure that, ensure that the security of the additional funding is needed is there, that has the approval of council. The member will be aware, particularly with the, the new super councils, that there's different there's new criteria. All that's all in a good place, uh, and I look forward, like the member, to making a public announcement of when this programme can be delivered. Mr. McKinney. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the minister? She's touched a bit on the question that I'm asking, but uh, can she detail the extent of partnership funding uh, required for the project? Well, certainly in response to Kahla Hushin, I know the member uh, made some reference to it. Um, I mean, we're working very, very closely with the, with the council. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a very positive uh, experience in terms of people want to see this programme delivered. In the same way, the, the programme and the sports facilities were delivered for Coleraine. It's part of that, that package. Um, the processes in terms of making sure that the committees and the full council have ratified the money that, that's one process, but as well as that, that the, the questions and the queries that are now in the final stages within the business cases are completed before a final announcement is made. But I have no reason or no indication to believe that none of this is impossible. In fact, uh, I would be very, very optimistic that this is something we can announce fairly soon. And it comes to Roy Vegas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could, could the Minister justify to the arts sector, particularly those who had suffered the 20% uh, cuts, uh, how uh, they have had to endure reduced funding this year or even funding withdrawn in year, and yet she's able to find additional funding uh, for a capital funding for the Dungiven area related to the Londonderry City of, of Culture. And what sustainability is being used to ensure that in the future money will be available for all groups? Well, um, one is a capital programme, one is a resource programme. Uh, this has been uh, organised for and developed for at least a year and a half. So that's why good progress has been made. In terms of the resource, that's the difference between the capital and the resource for the money for the Arts Council. The budgets haven't been confirmed yet. Uh, in terms of uh, justifying it, I absolutely can justify it because the member, even though he lives in uh, the east of the, the, the county uh, in Antrim, uh, he will know that particularly in that 
whole swathe of the shoreline and indeed in the northwest and particularly west of the ban. Investment of this nature uh, hasn't been what it should over decades. Uh, he may be happy enough or co content with that. I'm certainly not. I'm, I'm certainly not content either with the fact that, given the seriousness of a lack of support and value, particularly around the arts, perhaps now people will see the need to support an overarching all departmental strategy for culture and arts. Thank you. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Question five, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for his question. A short list of eight companies who could provide expert advice was identified by CPD using the RIBA database uh, first. This list was reduced to three. Three companies were immediately ruled out as they were already directly involved in the regi regional stadia program pr and projects. Another company was ruled out as they were not available during the period of, of the review and a further company did not respond to CPD's request. Of the remaining three companies, uh, KSS were deemed to be the most suitable and were therefore engaged by CPD. As part of the process to engage the independent technical expert advisors for the review team, CPD specifically sought the appropriate conflict of interest assurances from the eligible companies in terms of ensuring that any company who had previously worked on the regional stadia program or any of its constituent projects would be ruled out would be ruled not eligible to advise them off the review team and a supplementary from mr cree i can uh, thank the minister for her response uh, fully full response but is the minister not concerned that the design group selected had a direct connection to the contractors appointed to carry out the work at casement well, the member will be aware, because I, I remember the member raising something similar when I went in front of the committee, that this is a very, very small pool that we're dealing with. The connection with this company is the connection of one of the partners who are developing the stadia, uh, and it's, they're connected and they're involved in developing stadia right across Britain and indeed even other parts of Ireland. Um, I don't, and neither did CPD, because I'm, as a member, will be aware, I mean, the, the power review has I deliberately sent it to another department to look at, and I asked for the assurance in CPD, and they sought the assurance and were assured by the response they got. Uh, so I don't believe that it's the direct conflict of interest that the member perhaps perceives it to be. I call Mr. Basil McRae. Could the minister tell us uh, what authority she thinks the Sports Ground Safety uh, Authority has? Um, that this isn't. This isn't related to this question at all, uh, but certainly in terms of the authority that they have and the respect they have, there are many people who look towards the Sports Ground Safety Authority for certainly, certainly in terms of feedback and guidance. Uh, but I mean, if the member wishes to ask me a question relevant to this, I'll try and answer it. Thank you. And I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Uh, question number seven. As a member um, of the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee, he will be aware that on the 1st of October, my officials will brief the committee in its role as a super consultee uh, on the findings from the bill consultation. I will consider all comments the committee wishes to make regarding the content of the bill. And after the briefing, I will publish the report of the consultation. I remain committed to Anakna Gilga, and the consultation shows once again the huge levels in support of an act uh, are there. Nearly 13,000 people responded to the consultation. 95% of those are in support of legislation for an Irish Language Act. I am determined to, pro to progress the bill as far as I possibly can, and I call on all, all sides of this House to show their support. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley for a supplement. Uh, as Fagra, 
a Khorfi Vraj and Chonol and Shaw August in the Kartish and the Horchdove. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the Irish language community uh, in this region has been waiting for legislation which would give them uh, the rights which they so richly deserve. Uh, and I hope that the process that the Minister uh, has uh, initiated uh, will eventually bear fruit and bring them that legislation. Um, can I ask the Minister how she intends to proceed uh, post-consultation? Um, the member will be aware um, that indeed ma many people have been waiting on an Achnagil because it's very, very important in terms of language rights. I have met extensively with people as part of the consultation project process and indeed many people throughout this sector and all different sectors. It is incumbent that we get and that I certainly receive cross-party support to have this brought in front of the executive. What I have said to people uh, particularly who are lobbying for this. My door's wide open. It always has been. Uh, I am one of the advocates for this. Uh, perhaps people, I'm not suggesting the member does this, but perhaps people who have to be persuaded of the need of an Achna could talk to the people uh, you know, whose parties are in the executive about trying to convince them to support this. Because I think it would be something that people would certainly see as a sign that people have moved on politically and recognised that the language doesn't belong to one section of the community, it belongs to us all. And I believe certainly that an Irish Language Act is well overdue. And certainly for generations who are waiting on language rights, it would definitely be a sign that this place is moving in the right direction. I can catch the boy in the in Ira, female or woher, while I'm doing a hard and yeah, I guess we taste the sun again there. In that talker, Kirsty Gilliga, could you hear it? The at the chance that Aki the talk at the aisle on football, Ella, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, of course agree with uh, Mr. Bradley, but to ask a minister, uh, and she talks about trying to achieve support from across the community. I was on the Newer Newton Arts Road yesterday. In a, in a community centre, a church centre, and there was an exhibition there on, on the Irish language. And I wanted to ask the minister, uh, of course, we welcome that. What steps she has taken, or is taking, to try and achieve support right across the board for an Irish language act? Well, the, the member rightly points out that the language is cherished, uh, it's supported, and it's enjoyed by members right across the community, and that goes right throughout communities including different churches. There's an unhealthy assumption that once people hear of a percentage and support for Nakna Gilga, they assume that they're all from one side of the community. I can tell the member that responses in the consultation for Nakna Gilga came from right across the community. And for me, that gave me heart, because at times the Irish language, particularly in this place, has been the subject of some very offensive commentary. And right across the community, people are saying, Right across churches, people are saying an Irish Language Act absolutely threatens no one. It's the language belongs to everybody. So I know within that 95 per cent, there is overwhelming support from everybody in the community for this to be brought forward. Uh, and you know, the responses in the consultation, when the report is published, people can see that for themselves. Thank you. I'll call Mr. Alec Maskey. Uh, Kesh, over to Hock, uh, uh, question number eight, please. Thank the member for his question. The recent success of boxers from the north at major competitions once again highlights the strength of the sport. I would like to take this opportunity to congr congratulate Paddy Barnes, Michael Cullinan, Carl Frampton and many others on their recent success. Moving on to criteria for funding, I can confirm that affiliation to an internationally recognised governing body is the standard required for the majority of sport NIs funding programmes. This ensures that the club's activities are independently regulated and adhere to clear and consistent standards of safety, coaching and child protection. The importance of this has been demonstrated in the criteria for recent boxing investment programmes, which states that clubs must be affiliated to the Irish Amateur Boxing Association at the time of the award, and that this upon receipt of a final letter of offer. The aim of the programme which received lottery funding of £3.27 million is to help boxing address the needs of local clubs 
around development and sustainability, the provision of suitable facilities and the provision of boxing equipment. But I'm sorry, that's the end of uh, the period for listed questions. Um, we now move on to topical questions. And uh, before I move on, can I inform members that uh, questions 3, 4, 5, 7 and 10 have been withdrawn. Uh, and I call Mr. Jim Allister. In regard to the uh, sporting affiliation regime, which the minister supports and which currently prevails in Northern Ireland, what is the pathway for a young Northern Ireland athlete who aspires to represent Team GB in the Olympics to be able to do that? What is the pathway presently for that? Well, certainly in the last Olympics in 2012, the teams were called uh, GB in Northern Ireland. That's, that's what their official title was. However, it's up to the governing bodies to bring forward and re recommend athletes for those competitions. Uh, the governing body for boxing on Ireland is the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. The governing body for England is the, the English, same for Scottish and same for Welsh. Uh, and I mean, that is, the, I'm assuming the members talking about boxing, that is the, the, the pathway in which they bring forward. And I assure the Minister I'm not just talking about boxing. Boxing illustrates the point. But to take that, all these young athletes are told that under the Belfast Agreement, which the member is a, now a proponent of, they have the right to express their Britishness or their Irishness. But by virtue of the imposition of this affiliation requirement to, say, the Irish Boxing Association, the only way a young local boxer can box internationally is to wrap himself in an Irish tricolour. Why is the minister sustaining that discrimination? Well, first of all, I've reminded the member on several occasions that I completely refute any allegation he makes that I'm being discriminatory towards, towards any child or young person, and yet he hides behind parliamentary privilege and won't say it outside. First of all, he's wrong. It isn't I mean, the Good Friday Agreement, which I have been a supporter of from its inception, um, does promote the, the identity uh, in terms of if a person wants to identify themselves as British and Irish or both, they're entitled to. It's the governing bodies, it's the rules of the governing bodies, and the sports, render, the sports governing bodies for each of the disciplines who provide the rules. Uh, it isn't down to the Good Friday Agreement, it's down to the rules of the governing bodies, and they are governed by world-renowned or organisations. So I would suggest that if the member insists on providing information that is factually incorrect, then he needs, he needs to ensure that, that he is given the families who are coming to him for support the proper information. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I uh, acknowledge the generosity of the Minister in her press release regarding the Commonwealth uh, Youth Games athletes? I think it's an uh, uh, admirable thing that she's given congratulations to them, and I realise that there are some political issues, but she's done a very good job. Could the Minister tell me if her department is involved in any way in the preparation of the bid to bring the Commonwealth Youth Games to Northern Ireland? And if so, if there's any update in progress? Well, first of all, I have, from coming into the department, been very, very clear and very consistent that regardless of the athletes and how they describe themselves in terms of national identity, they've got my support. If they're from here, they've got my support. How they describe themselves in terms of their political or religious affiliation, for me, is academic. And I, I believe that most people in this House are like that. Uh, I, I have supported the Commonwealth Youth Games bid. I have met, met with the Council on several occasions. The difficulty for me is, and to be frank, and I'm sure the members are aware of this, that when it comes to major sporting events, it's within the gift of Daddy to promote this. I understand that the Daddy Minister, who's now resigned, uh, before he did uh, give support for this event. I know that officials are all talking to each other about trying to make sure that this bid actually happens. Uh, but I'm certainly keen to give support for this because I believe this would be a great opportunity for children and young people. 
Call Mr McRae for supplementary. Uh, and uh, I do acknowledge uh, the Minister's even-handedness in this, and I wanted to put that on the record. And I do realise that it is primarily Detty that are taking the lead on the matter. But would you be aware that there is concern from the Commonwealth Youth Council that failure to agree a bid by the Northern Ireland Executive by the end of September means that we may lose this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? And could she undertake, perhaps, to write to the departments or whatever to encourage them to support a, 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 a Games, which I think everybody thinks is a good thing? Absolutely. And you know, and that's already in progress. We're actually writing to the uh, Acting First Minister at the minute and the Minister for Finance and Personnel. But as well as that, we're working with officials in those departments because we, I, I am totally uncomfortable with this. We all looked that Commonwealth Games Council in the face and said we do our best. At the minute, I can put my hand in my heart and say I'm doing my best. And I will ensure that not only will I do my best, but I'll go that bit further. Because if the bid is successful, Everybody will certainly claim their credit, but if it's not, I want to ensure that I've done everything I could to try and have as much support and resource uh, and attention given as possible. And I don't believe we're, we're there yet. And um, hopefully, we'll be have this concluded within a week or so. But certainly, and the other aspect of it is, it would need to be cleared under urgent procedure because, as a member is aware, there are no executive uh, meetings happening at the minute. And I believe, as an example, where children and young people. Are going to be penalised for something that's well beyond any of their doing. I don't like it. Uh, can I thank the Minister for the statement so far? Can the Minister give us an update on the progress of the decade of centenaries? Well, um, certainly, the, the, I mean, in March 2012, there was an announcement that we, we would bring forward a decade of centenaries. We, in terms of the executive, uh, from 1912 to 22, um, and within that, we're looking at certain areas like the First World War, the Battle of the Somme, 1916 rising, saying of the Covenant, limited suffrage for women, um, the Irish Volunteers. There's many, many issues that we we, we were going to cover, and will cover. Uh, the important thing is that it isn't open to interpretation; it's based on historical fact. Uh, and certainly, I can just speak for Decal that even within um, some of my arm's length bodies, and certainly working with great advocates in the Heritage Lottery Fund, we're trying to bring forward a suite of activities and initiatives that will actually give um, honour and give inclusivity to people who want to celebrate the different events as part of that decade of centenaries. Well, can I, can I thank the Minister for her answer? But can I ask the Minister, can she explore the potential for exhibitions in prony libraries and museums for the 1916 period? Certainly, uh, I, I can give a guarantee. I mean, prony, for example, is leading, particularly in terms of some of the documentation. I mean, they have an archive. They have people working in the Public Records Office that have excellent skills, I, I believe, or second to none across this island. Uh, so prony are leading in that. Um, and there, with the, within the DECAL family, we're working very, very closely with museums and extremely closely with libraries because libraries are based in most communities. And it's really important that if there is a possibility to have exhibitions that can be brought around uh, libraries, that we, then we exploit those opportunities. And that may engender some conversation, some inclusivity, particularly for young people. Uh, and particularly for people not so young uh, who want to you know, hear what people have to say, but also you know, look at the historical facts and actually use it, perhaps, because I know in other events, some of these have been used as a way of trying to bring forward some good relations, particularly in communities that have been hard-pressed. Thank you. And I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, my question has been already answered. That one I had prepared, but uh, it was going to be about the Commonwealth Games. But I will ask the the, um, the minister: Could she update the house on the stewardship of Sport NI as a body? Well, I thank the member for a question. Um, certainly, the interim chief executive and this team, and indeed um, the auditors, are still working through some of the grievances that were brought forward. Uh, as a member will be aware, as a member of the CAL committee, uh, I brought uh, the report, initial report, to the CAL committee, and I did give a, 
uh, commitment that I'd be coming back. That process is still underway. Uh, the member will also be aware that of the three processes that are underway in relation to casement and everything else, but certainly the grievances that are from this, the audit office is dealing with this. But certainly in terms of sport and I, uh, they're still working through it. I, I am really keen that they're given as much time and latitude and space to get through that, because some of the issues that were brought to my attention are very, very serious indeed. And I'll call Ms McEvitt for a supplement. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm sure the Minister agrees with me that uh, that until this situation has resolved, there's a lot of our sport bodies and volunteers that are involved in sport uh, who they're the big losers in all of this. But could I ask the Minister, uh, would you be in a position uh, to be able to enlighten the House on where the board actually sits at the moment and what responsibilities the like of the volunteers are actually losing out on? First of all, I haven't had any indication that anybody has been impacted in terms of support as a result of this, because I've asked that question. If anything, Sport and I enjoys a lot of loyalty and support from without the, throughout the community. So no group has been impacted at all by an internal matter for Sport and I, which is, in a sense, it's a good thing. However, the public confidence uh, and within Sport and I has been tested. But I think people, certainly the uh, action that I initiated, people were assured by that. Um, certainly in the short term, the board members. Um, have remained, the ones who didn't resign have remained, and fair play to, to them. And indeed, credit to the people who resigned, who give at least uh, eight to ten years of their volunteering time to the development of sport and for sport. And I, and I genuinely thank them for that. I'm currently looking at a process to add to the board, um, because I believe that the, the, the board needs support, and I'm looking at that. I'm actually delighted at the overwhelming response, even within the civil service, for people you know, to volunteer in the short term until we go to a full public appointments. But the point is, and I think the concern that the member had, that I haven't heard of any, despite asking, and I've asked the governing bodies, has been any direct impact on delivery as a result of what's going on in Sport and I, and the question has been answered by no. Okay, and I call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you'll be aware that I've been correspondence with written questions in regard to the registration of community and amateur sports clubs. In your answers to me, you've stated it's the responsibility of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. When I check the legislation, they actually say that Sport NI have a role in recognising the governing bodies. Could the Minister look into this and actually explore if Sport NI or she herself has any responsibility in that role? I certainly will, and of anything, I mean, the member has certainly pointed, he has corresponded to me on this issue, and what I don't want is, because I mean, this happens across the board, I get questions, as a member we were, about sports delivery in a constituency, and I, the answer I'm given is, I'm quoting a recreational order which deals with councils. I don't want to be given passing the book. I want to, I, what I will en endeavour to do is actually find out where the responsibility, where mine starts and stops, and where someone else starts and stops, and try and get a bit of clarity around this. Commissioner Swan for supplementary. I thank the Minister very much for that guarantee and when she's doing that. Could she especially look at homing pigeons and racing societies? Because that's one of the organisations that has actually fallen out outside the amateur sports club's regulations in all spheres of both funding and grants and all the rest of it because of that definition. Well, certainly in the first instance, I'll try and get the definition, and then I'll come back to the member specifically about pigeons. <laughs> yeah, time, short and sweet. Uh, time is up, and just uh, before we turn to the debate of members. Did you say a point of order? Yes. Mr Speaker, understand in Order 20A-1, topical questions are allowed to be 15 minutes. Could I ask you to possibly look in the future, if we get to a stage where that 15 minutes has not been utilised, but there are still members retaining in the chamber, that you look to draw them either from standing in their place or from a rotation in some other fashion? Yeah, I think the current kind of uh, procedures don't allow that. But you've raised a question which we can explore to see if uh, there is any flexibility. What I had intended to do in the uh, topicals was finished early, was uh, just move straight to the debate that we've already started so that we don't lose any time. But we've, we've uh, almost landed on it precisely. So if you just take your ease until we change the top table.